I started doing magic probably around 1967, and there wasn't really anything on television. Mostly it was books, books in the library. So I read you know, about Houdini and Thurston. Thurston really fascinated me because of the card manipulation. You know, he did a whole act with rising cards, and he did all of the back palming, the card manipulation, and that really that really fascinated me. And I liked card magic. Uh, my earliest uh, magic book was the Golden Book of Magic by the great Merlini, and in there the the young kid that's featured in the book wears Asian clothes and wears a mask, and maybe that made a big impression on me when I was a kid. So those are some of my earliest influences uh, are books and, you know, the magic of the golden age, reading about that and dreaming about being a stage magician. I think it's interesting when young people get imprinted with magic. My generation, it was stage magicians working on stage. So all of our magic was visualized on stage. Lance Burton, my friend, and other <clears throat> magicians, Brett Daniels, Kevin James, we all imagined ourselves on stage. Nowadays, everybody watches magic on a phone and it's all this close-up magic and they see themselves doing close-up magic. But in our day, it was grand stage magic. That was my vision. I have a new show called Magic Quest and it talks about many of my inspirations. And one of my inspirations was the uh, Lon Chaney. His father was the man with a thousand faces. And I started collecting masks. I get inspirations for music. I saw Carlos Santana at the Woodstock Festival in 69. Of course, Houdini. Bruce Lee mag uh, was my inspiration for martial arts. Um, that's Pamela Coleman Smith, who designed the tarot deck, the Rider Waite tarot deck. So I get a lot of inspiration from tarot cards and studying the history of magic and hermetics and alchemy. Of course, Doug Henning, Alice Cooper was a big inspiration. I got to be his opening act. Diana Ross, I was her opening act. Charlie Chaplin, outside of magic, the great pantomime, silent communicator. George Carlin, comedian, very fast-witted, and he uh, hired me as his opening act as well. So a lot of these are my inspirations outside of magic. Marcel Marceau for pantomime. Uh, action heroes, of course, um, music, John Lennon, world leaders. So I have, a, oh, of course, Eugene Berger. So I have a lot of inspirations outside of magic that add to um, the texture of my show because I do kabuki theater and martial arts and quick change and pantomime and mask work. It's all of the things that aren't magic that uh, I think make my performances stand out. You know, I learned so much by teaching, and I've been teaching magic for over 30 years, and a lot has to do with e Eugene Berger's influence. I wanted to um, study with Eugene, and Eugene was a teacher and a philosopher on magic, and I, and I, I studied how to teach from Eugene Berger. I remember precisely where I met Eugene Berger. I met Eugene Berger at uh, Mostly Magic Nightclub. And I have a story about that. When I met him, he said, um, you know, I, I know you only from the stage. And I, I said, I know you mostly only from your, your books, Eugene. And he said, what are the three most important principles of magic? And I I hesitated and he said, the three most important principles of magic are illustrated with these ropes. The first principle is imagination, something a magician has to have lots and lots of imagination. And he handed me the rope and he said, pull on it, it doesn't stretch, doesn't it? I said, no, because, but you have to stretch your imagination. The second important principle of magic is patience. Most magicians have very little patience. And the third, and probably, well, one of the most important, is daily practice. You have to practice every day, and it has to be regular practice. And he said, 
Which one of these principles is the most important? Practice, patience, or imagination? And as I thought, he touched them to his beard, and they stretched to exactly the same size. And he said, although, although these ropes look to be different size, all three ropes are equal in the eyes of the wise. Patience, practice, and imagination are all equal parts in the arts of transformation. And then he touched them to his beard and instantly they changed back. Lots and lots of imagination, daily practice, and a little bit of patience. And that's when I learned from Eugene that magic was more than just tricks, but it was a philosophy and a way to lead our lives. That story, that story comes from the time we met at Mostly Magic Nightclub, about 1987. And that, that encounter where he kind of quizzed me on the principles of magic. So I made a story out of it. And I like to share it with my friends because we do need a lot of imagination. And that's why I have so many inspirations outside of magic. We do need to practice daily. I mean, I just love practicing so much. And I learned from musicians to fall in love with the practice of magic. I probably practice more than I ever perform. And the third is patience. We have to be patient with ourselves. Today in the magic world, we get th so much stuff thrown at us in the magazines and on the internet. TikTok is like, oh my God, you just you get barraged with magic. It's almost too much. And sometimes you just have to be patient and drill deep and good things take time. Everybody wants immediate results, but good things take time. I think theatrical skills, of course, uh, communication skills, movement skills, interpersonal relationship building skills. Uh, Larry Haas, who is the dean of the Magic and Mystery School, he says the number one goal of a magical performance is relationship building. You're building relationships with all these individuals, creating an audience. So you have to have good social skills, I believe, to connect with an audience. Um, these days, also, people need good social media skills and good um, video skills. There's a lot of skills that you needed to be a magician in today's world. To be a hobbyist, to be a magic fan, to be a magic enthusiast, you don't need all of those things. You just need to love magic. And that's fine, too. You know, there's a lot of people that love the opera that aren't opera singers. There's a lot of people that love magic that are not performers. Many of uh, the students that come to our school, both online and here in person, they don't have visions of being a Las Vegas star. They love magic and they want to make good magic for their friends and family. They're interested in the science, the illusion of magic, the possibility of magic, how magic can enhance their life, but they don't necessarily want to make an income out of magic. Some do. I mean, I get some students here like Matt Franco started here, you know, 12 years old and now he won America's Got Talent. Aaron Crow, you know, we have famous uh, winners of uh, competitions that come to our school that study with us. But that's not everybody. Not everybody wants to be a star. Some people are just want to be able to be the magician in their community or the magician in their own lives. Well, it, quite frankly, it developed because I wanted to spend more time with Eugene Berger. And I had to find out ways to get him to the East Coast. So we decided to do an invitational gathering of our friends. And it was so well received that we decided to do it every year. And we did it every year for nine years as a small conference. And it grew and grew and grew. And then we decided that people wanted something different and we wanted to do something different. So we held private classes where magicians could come and perform and get feedback and we could help them with their shows. And now we have classes in close-up magic, stage magic, mentalism, uh, speaking, storytelling, street magic, grand illusions. We have a full series of classes that we do, um, you know, one or two classes a month, mostly online now, 
But in October, we'll be opening back up, hopefully. We'll see how it goes. But, uh, you know, we have students from all over the world that study with us online. Books have fallen out of popularity with many of the newer magicians that meet magic online. They meet it through social media. They meet it through television. They meet it through the computer. And so they interface with social media, with YouTube, and gather the information. However, it's a very small part of magic culture. So much of the rich history of magic is in the books. So even though there's a lot of magic on the surface, there's a huge amount of magic underneath the surface. And unless people learn the skill of reading, they will never be able to access all that information. And that's going to be a huge advantage to the magicians that do read, that do research, that look on Dennis Bear's site, incredible site, that go to the Conjuring Arts Archive, that know how to search magic and find magic. And you can do that on the internet, but you also have to learn how to read and how to interpret the instructions, as Levent says, as sheet music. Instructions are kind of sheet music to learn how to be a magician. And there's such a rich, rich history that I think a lot of young magicians or newer magicians are missing. So maybe that's uh, a little bit of a, of a tip on learning magic is to really learn how to read a magic book and perform the magic from the book. Go to magicalwisdom.com and everything is there. We have many free episodes that you can watch at le leisure. We have nearly 600 one hour episodes on all different topics of magic close-up magic, parlor magic, stage magic, the grand masters, you know, um, storytelling magic, just incredible archives for you. And it's only $30 a year and you get access. And if you uh, take a different membership, you can access all of the different archives. And I do personal coaching with students all over Europe, all over Asia, all over the United States, just everywhere in the world. I do personal coaching on, on Zoom, and I've been working online for 11 years now, so the Zoom thing is not new to me. It's new to many of you. However, I've been teaching online for 11 years now. Mm -hmm.